Hello, dear listeners. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am Liv, she of the podcast. Well, I announced last week, after so long of reading episodes of Lore Olympus on and off, I recently got an iPad and so binged the whole thing like a lunatic. Now, why did it take an iPad, you ask? Turns out what I really needed to get hooked on the story was a better, less distracting medium for consumption. Before, I'd read it on my computer. I wanted it big because it's gorgeous, but then it's just like a tab on your browser, and it's just not the same. On an iPad, it's like reading a flippin' beautiful movie. I don't even know. Anyway, I binged Lore Olympus hard, and like I said last week, that won't be changing how I tell the stories of the gods, specifically Hades and Persephone, but it did inspire me to dig a little deeper into those very same gods. I love what Lore Olympus is doing with the stories. They're funny and sweet and beautifully illustrated. So I thought, why not learn a little bit more about the subject matter? Hades and Persephone aren't my favorite gods. Not that there's anything wrong with that, nor are they my favorite couple. But they are interesting as hell. Persephone and Demeter and their mystery cult? Ugh, so fascinating. So... In the spirit of the premiere of Lore Olympus's second season, I give you Episode 86, Bringer of Death, the Dread Goddess Persephone and her mother, Demeter. I begin to sing of rich-haired Demeter, awful goddess, of her and her trim-ankled daughter whom Adonius wrapped away, given to him by all-seeing Zeus, the loud thunderer. Apart from Demeter, lady of the golden sword and glorious fruits, she was playing with the deep-bosomed daughters of Oceanus and gathering flowers over a soft meadow. Roses and crocuses and beautiful violets, irises also and hyacinths and the narcissus, which earth made to grow at the will of Zeus and to please the host of many, to be a snare for the bloom-like girl, a marvelous radiant flower. It was a thing of awe whether for deathless gods or mortal men to see. From its root grew a hundred blooms, and it smelled most sweetly, so that all wide heaven above and the whole earth and the sea's salt swell laughed for joy. And the girl was amazed, and reached out with both hands to take the lovely toy. But the wide-pathed earth yawned there in the plain of Nyssa, and the Lord, host of many, with his immortal horses, sprang out upon her, the son of Kronos, he who has many names. That is the beginning of the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, translated by Hugh Evelyn White. Thankfully, it's in the public domain. So, you'll find a bonus episode in your feeds today of me reading the entirety of the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, the oldest version we have of the story of Demeter's search for her daughter, kidnapped and brought to the underworld. Persephone, or Kore, is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter. And yes, Demeter and Zeus are indeed brother and sister, but if you can find yourself still shocked about something like that, you need to listen to more of this podcast. She's the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, but ultimately, she's the daughter of Demeter more than she is anything else. Demeter is a devoted mother, an obsessive mother. Demeter, of course, is associated with the earth and growth, and as such, of the Olympian gods, she most resembles her mother, Rhea, a mother earth goddess type figure. Being the mother of Persephone is a major part of Demeter's personality, and her search for her daughter is Demeter's primary story in all the mythology. Her search for her daughter results in Persephone's return from the underworld, being associated with the seasons and the return of life to earth, And it results in the creation of the Eleusinian Mysteries, an incredibly important mystery cult of ancient Greece that is still quite the mystery. That the Homeric hymn to Demeter is devoted to this story, the kidnapping and Demeter's search for Persephone, is important. 
The Homeric hymns are some of the most ancient stories that we have from ancient Greece, often believed to be written by the same person as the Iliad and the Odyssey, hence why they're referred to as the Homeric hymns. Even the later Greek historian Thucydides believed the songs to be written by Homer. They tell the stories of the gods singing their praises and worship. They're fucking beautiful. To be clear, we don't know if they were written all by the same person or if Homer was even real, but the point of these hymns is that they are old. They are as old as the Iliad and the Odyssey. I've told the story of Hades, Persephone, and Demeter before, very early on this podcast, but still, I won't retell it here, because the Homeric hymn does such a beautiful job of that. But I will remind you all of the basics of what happened. Because... Persephone isn't Persephone until she's taken to the underworld by Hades. Before that, she's Kore, maiden, virgin. Kore represents spring and rebirth, fertility of the earth, innocence. Kore is a girl, an innocent girl, whose days were spent picking flowers with nymphs, not so far from her mother, and never alone. Kore, the maiden, was doing just that when she was noticed by Hades, Adonius, the god of the dead, the king of the underworld. Hades saw her, and he, according to some, mostly men, fell in love with her. Which may have been true, I don't know his heart, but regardless of whether he saw this young girl, this virgin, and fell in love with her, she didn't go willingly. Hades went to his brother, Zeus, the king of the gods and father of Persephone. He asked Zeus whether he could have the girl, because of course it was Zeus's call to make, not Demeter's, and certainly, definitely not Kore's. Zeus said he could, or possibly he said that Hades could just get around Demeter's wishes by simply taking her down to the underworld and marrying her there. This was because the underworld was a different space, not governed by the same rules as the Earth. It wasn't governed by Zeus, and it was certainly not governed by Demeter. So, he did. Hades appeared to Kore when she was with her friends, picking flowers innocently, admiring those Narcissus, the beautiful things. She reached for a Narcissus, stretching her arm toward the flower, when the earth opened up beneath her, and from the chasm emerged the god of the dead, in his chariot, pulled by his deathless, immortal, coal-black horses. This is how everything changed for Kore. It's how she became Persephone, the destroyer, the bringer of death. Hades brought her into the underworld, away from her mother's prying eyes. Of course, you remember, Demeter searched for her daughter endlessly, causing so much trouble for the Olympians and for the Earth itself. So much trouble that Zeus relented and forced Persephone to be returned to her mother. But not before she'd eaten at least one, maybe a handful, of pomegranate seeds, given to her by Hades, thereby forcing her to return to him and spend a third of her time there, with him in the underworld, as its queen. When she returns to the underworld, the earth withers and dies, crops turn brown and dry, the earth falls fallow, death descends upon it. The name Persephone means some variation of bringer of death or destroyer, But like her husband, she has many names, all of the same basic meaning. In some places, she was called Persephata or Persephassa, though the name means the same thing. Or in Latin, she's Proserpine or Proserpina. Once she was brought to the underworld and forced to marry Hades to become its dread goddess queen, she was a maiden no longer. The name Kore fell away, though sometimes it's used to describe her when she returns to her mother when the earth is fertile again. As queen of the underworld, Persephone takes the goddess Hecate as her companion. Hecate tried her best to help Demeter find Persephone when she was taken by Hades, though it isn't clear this is why it makes sense to me that Hecate becomes her companion there, because Demeter can't be there. As with almost all Greek myths, there are alternative versions to the relationship of Hades and Persephone. It's not always referred to as a kidnapping and rape, In one instance in Homer, they're simply referred to as husband and wife, but he isn't telling their story, he's just referring to them as a couple. Hesiod, meanwhile, does note the abduction, but then Hesiod hated women, so I don't often go with his versions. 
To me, it's the Homeric hymn that lends credence to the idea that one of the more ancient versions, and therefore one of the more accurate versions of the story, did involve a kidnapping. Even the later Roman sources continued that same story. But regardless, as I've said before, that is the only major drama in the lives of Hades and Persephone. Sure, it starts horribly, but throughout the mythology and the beliefs of the ancient Greeks, the pair were otherwise without much in the way of conflict. They did their jobs, governing the underworld side by side. Persephone is often referred to with names and epithets that make me believe that she was maybe even more respected than her husband. The story of Persephone's first moments as queen of the underworld isn't told. We don't have a story about her taking on the new role, about how she felt about Hades once they were married and it was finalized that she would indeed spend a large portion of her time with him in the underworld as its queen. We don't know how their relationship grew, whether it grew. We don't know if they loved each other or if it even mattered. But when we hear about Persephone as the underworld's queen, she is a force of nature. She is its queen and seems to take that role very seriously. Certainly, those who talk about her as its queen take her seriously. As queen of the underworld, Persephone was one of the most respected and revered and feared goddesses. One of the most powerful. She is referred to as awful Persephone, the dread goddess Persephone, cruel Persephone, of course, these aren't particularly flattering names, but they do connote power and importance. They show that the people of the ancient world respected her authority, that they feared her as they should the woman who would play a role in deciding their fates once they died. Of all the goddesses, Persephone was most feared, and frankly, in a really badass way. I'm asked so, so often about the relationship of Hades and Persephone whether they loved each other, whether they had a good relationship. But honestly, I think that what makes Lore Olympus so powerful and interesting is that in the mythology, there aren't really stories about them as a couple. There is the story of the abduction, the kidnapping, the rape that leads to Persephone being queen of the underworld. And then there isn't much else. This is what allows Lore Olympus to expand upon them, to create this world where their relationship is passionate and interesting, a whole world where their relationship didn't begin with a horrible rape and instead was something romantic and interesting. My opinion on this has absolutely evolved as I got deeper into Lore Olympus, but I now believe that that's why maybe it isn't horribly problematic to romanticize their relationship. If there were more stories of horrible things Hades had done, like Zeus even, then it would be much harder. But clearly Rachel knows that because Zeus, ugh, she certainly paints Zeus with an honest brush in Lore Olympus. Oh, he's great. But truly, I, I've had a problem with that in the past, the romanticization. And still, I won't be doing it in the podcast because the mythology of them isn't romantic. It's it's not ideal. It does begin with the kidnapping. But it also is is so open to interpretation beyond that part of the story that I think it's really powerful what's being done. So, like I've said, there aren't really any stories about their relationship once the pair begins to serve as king and queen of the underworld. Many heroes and mortals encounter the two, but they have no stories of their own. Persephone and Hades appear in so, so many stories, but not as the main characters. Odysseus contends with the pair, though it's mainly Persephone's wrath that he fears, when he travels to the underworld to speak with Tiresias on orders of Circe. Orpheus, of course, must please the dread goddess and her husband in order to save his beloved Eurydice from her fate in the underworld. Persephone sends a ghost to visit Jason and the Argonauts, a man who died years earlier and just desperately missed seeing familiar faces. Persephone appears in Virgil's Aeneid, but we'll get there. Electra calls to Persephone for luck in her and Orestes' plan to kill their mother, Clytemnestra. It's Persephone who's invoked in many ancient cases of necromancy, raising the dead, or witchcraft. Medea worships Persephone and Hades in the telling of her story in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Persephone, and to a lesser extent, Hades, have a hand in so, so many ancient Greek myths and plays. They make decisions on who, if anyone, might be spared from the world of the dead. 
They must be appeased and feared in order to keep the world running smoothly. These chthonic deities, those dwelling beneath the earth, are always out of sight and always in control. That all said, one of the only anecdotes that exists when it comes to the relationship of Hades and Persephone does involve a certain nymph named Minthy. What's the story, you ask? Well, it seems Hades once did have an affair with Minthy, and Persephone turned her into mint as punishment. And yeah, that's the entirety of the story. While there are limited stories about Demeter, Persephone, and Hades, just as they played a role in so, so many myths and plays, in the real world, the gods themselves were worshipped as some of the most important. Of course, Demeter was the goddess of grain and the harvest, so she was vital to the lives of the ancient Greeks who relied on her to help them produce the food necessary to sell, trade, survive. Demeter was worshipped differently from the other gods. She didn't rely on sacrifices, bloody, gory killing of animals just to please them. It was the daily acts of growing grain, harvesting, and all the things that come after that I won't try to understand that pleased the goddess Demeter and kept her happy with the mortals of the earth. It was, after all, Demeter's holy grain. Later, in Latin and Roman mythology, she was called Ceres and enjoyed the same level of importance and respect as Demeter in the earlier Greek world. In Rome, there was even a similar sort of festival mystery cult to what was involved with the Eleusinian mystery cult that revolved around Demeter and Persephone. Ugh, which brings us to the Eleusinian mystery cult. How many of you have asked me to cover it? Ugh, don't get me wrong. I plan to, but like so many other fascinating topics in Greek history and mythology, that one is too research intensive for my current life. It's on the list along with the Oracle, the Amazons, Atlantis that I will cover when this podcast is full time. Something that is likely to happen very soon. But for now, a general idea. First, what's a mystery cult? So they were common in ancient Greece. These were cults of worship devoted to a particular deity, but that involved, well, secret forms of worship. You had to be initiated into the cult in order to partake in all the rites and festivities, and they were secret, known only to those who were in the groups. Because of this, we don't actually know all that much about the Eleusinian mystery cult, the one devoted to Demeter and Persephone, but we do know it was one of the most famous, if not the most famous, mystery cult of all of ancient Greece. It began in Eleusis, and its headquarters of sorts remained there, at the great temple to Demeter. But its popularity spread far, far beyond Eleusis. The cult even spread into Rome, where the Romans who worshipped Ceres would perform similar rites and have similar festivals. I already told you that, I'm repeating myself. Our beloved god of wine, Dionysus, was worshipped at Eleusis too. It was, after all, a mystery cult devoted to the harvest, and that included Dionysus. Both Demeter and Dionysus are the Olympians devoted to the earth, to growth and rebirth, and so they were often side by side in worship of them. Even if the worship of Demeter didn't involve nearly as much drunken revelry and orgies, she wasn't quite as fun as her wine-loving counterpart. Eleusis was the city devoted to Demeter because, according to the myth of her search for Persephone, that's where she finally rested a while after searching so long in vain for her beloved daughter. She stopped in Eleusis disguised as an old woman. That story is told in the hymn to Demeter, so I won't tell you again here. But in the end, Demeter revealed herself to the people of Eleusis, telling them that they must build her a great temple. The people of Eleusis took this very seriously, and they did build the temple. And that is the temple that the mystery cult revolved around for so long. Once the temple was built, it's where Demeter found herself while she waited on her daughter, worried about her daughter. She couldn't bring herself to go to Olympus where the other gods were. They didn't have her worries. They couldn't understand. And of course, it was Zeus who'd let Hades take Persephone in the first place. Demeter didn't want to even look at him, so she stayed in Eleusis in her depression, not allowing anything to grow, just watching as the earth remained dead, dried up. It wasn't until Zeus finally had Persephone brought back from the underworld to Demeter, if not permanently, that Demeter allowed the earth to grow once more. 
She felt bad, though. Demeter didn't want to hurt the mortals. It's just that she was so, so sad. So to make up for all that time that they'd been unable to grow anything, she caused a prosperous earth and took one particular mortal under her wing. Triptolemus was a young man of Eleusis who Demeter picked to be her sidekick of sorts, the mortal who could pass on the goddess teachings to his fellow mortals. She taught him how best to grow the corn, and most importantly, she taught him and the city of Eleusis her sacred mystery rites. She taught them the Eleusinian mysteries, the best means of worshipping the goddess to provide the best harvest, mysteries that must be kept secret. There's so much more to them that we don't know. Things about happy time in the afterlife and, oh, I just, I want to dig more. But also, there's so much we don't know. The mortals took a solemn vow not to reveal these sacred mysteries. They would face horrible, divine punishment if they did. Or, in some cases, they simply couldn't. They couldn't utter it from their lips. And man, did they ever keep those secrets tight to their chests. Otherwise, I'd have already had an episode about the damn things. Finally, there's a second, very short, hymn to Demeter. I begin to sing of rich-haired Demeter, awful goddess, of her and her daughter, lovely Persephone. Hail, goddess, keep this city safe and govern my song. Ugh, thank you all for listening. Like I mentioned, you'll have a bonus episode in your feeds today that is a reading of the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, the story of Hades' kidnapping of Persephone and Demeter's search for her daughter. It's really interesting and beautiful and so refreshing that I can just read a source to you. Next week, I'll be back with the additional Pride episode I've been promising since June, which will include a very fun conversation with one of my favorite artists, Mary Phillips of Myths and Tits. We talked LGBTQIA representation in mythology and art that's been inspired by exactly that, among many other things. It was so, so much fun to talk to her, and while I haven't planned what else is going to go into that episode, I have hope and faith that it will be equally fun. As usual, please rate, review, subscribe. You know the drill. You're all the best. Thank you all for listening. I am Liv and I love this shit.